Well, Alex has, uh, has, has built that up and said, I'm going to talk about electronics and things. I'm not. I'm going to talk about electronic systems. And um, electronic systems are um, really where the product comes together. Um, and we'll see why as we go along. But I certainly stopped talking about hardware and software. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll understand why. Now, I'm not a uh, uh, reliability or a dependability expert. Um, but that doesn't stop me thinking about it. So in the same way, some of the stuff that I come up with may very well be obvious to you and others, other parts of it may not. And the other thing uh, that, that, that is relevant is that I am definitely an industrialist. So I've spent my lifetime working on getting things out. And, uh, and that definitely puts a different perspective on things. But in recent years, that's probably the last 20 or so years, I've spent a lot of time talking to um, uh, researchers and academics. And so I'm a little bit more familiar with the other side of the fence as well. So hopefully that bridge will turn out to, to give you something useful. Um, these slides will be available online, so you don't have to struggle to write them all down. Uh, and I won't be talking about everything which is on every slide. So uh, that's a bit of relief. Okay, where do the errors go? Um, it's an interesting question, uh, but it's a, a pragmatic question. Um, I mean, when we think of computing, we still tend to think of these great big rooms full of machines. Uh, but increasingly, computing has changed um, to the desktop. Uh, but even maybe, for, dare we mention, the uh, pocketable machines, which uh, really are quite stunning computers these days. Uh, so the visible face of computing today, and I can feel you scrunching up inside because I've heard people say, these are not really computers, this is not what computing is all about. But they are really computers. If you look at the, the contents of them, these days the facilities which are, which are in them are enabled by software. Software needs an engine to run on, uh, and that engine is a computer. It's a, an instruction set processing machine and it delivers functionality, which is not va vastly different from any others. But there is two classes of computers. That these ones, which you're, which you're very familiar with, and you all want to be reliable, but this is like want to be reliable. If your TomTom um, uh, -tom breaks down, you know, it's really annoying if you only bought it two years ago, but, you know, it's only £100. Uh, Okay, you, you, you decide that you're going to buy a Garmin next time and, uh, and you go out and buy a new one. It's not a big deal if any of this stuff fails. But what's less visible is the invisible face of computing. Um, this is in, indeed the same sort of concept, but it's the, you know, the, the, the medical view, the automotive, the, your car as a computer is, a, is a, uh, a novel concept. The embedded nature of computing in things like travel and even just basic logistics, like the, the exercise of bringing a cup of tea to your bedside table in the morning means you've got to have water you've got to have energy, you've got to have the materials to make and, and uh, make the cups and they're going to be made in China or something like that and they're going to be delivered halfway across the world and they're going to be delivered just in time because nobody delivers things and puts them in a store anymore um, and the biscuit, you know, it has no value and yet it involves crops being grown, processes being run on them, all of which are increasingly controlled or very, very strongly influenced by the embedded computer uh, world. So these are depend these these computers. On the other hand, we depend on. It wouldn't be far w before there would be a major catastrophe in the aeronautics industry if we didn't have computers. Not only on in the planes, but on the ground as well. Um, the energy industry needs them, and so it goes. You know, finance and everything. It's, there's the invisible face of computing, and that needs uh, dependability. So going back, and I thought this was an important point from getting my head around the problem, uh, is to ask myself, so what is this computing anyway? I mean, conceptually, a, it is just a, a fairly simple process of taking an enumerated phenomena, doing something with it to consolidate it or represent it, and presenting it in another form. Uh, frequently it involves state and time, um, even though they may not be apparent. Uh, so you can say they're always in there, but they may not matter. Uh, if, you, if you have a weather forecasting block in there and it, oh, and it takes so long to actually produce a prediction of the weather that it actually produces yesterday's weather tomorrow, then it's not a hell of a lot of use. So there is a time and, a, and there is a, a state dependency to things which don't really have 
a much uh, of a statement about this. Um, it can include phenomena ran ranging from concepts like human thinking, and these are these are pretty good because it's like uh, not all of this is going to be easily expressed in mathematics as a concept. But it's not prescriptive about the implementation technology nor about programmability. So we've we've said about computers and the model that we tend to have is that they've got a program and the program is flexible. You can write your own program, you can put it onto the computer, you execute it and it does what you want it to do. That's a very specific example, a general purpose computer. So leaping back a little bit in time, um, before my time even, uh, Hyperacus. Apparently this guy produced the first computing machine, a calculating machine, for determining planetary positions. Uh, this, was, this mechanism was found in the Mediterranean and anybody who's been watching, I think it was Horizon in recent months, they did a program on this. Quite fascinating because of course this is the thing that they, they found, pretty well a fossil. Uh, and a lot of the gears associated with it were missing. It doesn't look terribly exciting until you recognize that the guy, when he created this pretty well, had to make the metal himself. He had to file the teeth individually before files were really available. It's quite a major challenge to have done this thing. And it was used on boats to help with navigation. So it was, dependent, it was being depended upon. Apparently there were as many as 10 or 15 of these things in the world. They were not exactly volume production. But I think it's an, an illustration of uh, the, the, the need to solve it a, a, a mathematical problem and the technology which was available to do it. Now, it was an analog technology, but it was good enough for navigation. It wasn't actually until 1700 that, um, what's his name, uh, George Graham, uh, produced something which was rather more producible because this is a, uh, a machine, the metals available, the, the tools and the machine tools that started to become available as well and uh, although even, even in these days clocks were pretty well handmade, they were not as uh, handmade as they were in, um, uh, in the uh, earlier days. Now again, single task, continuous time, but a, a computation device which was, had a genuine use. Babbage's difference engine you will know about uh, because this is, this is the famous machine that went too far. Uh, he designed it and uh, couldn't make it. Uh, so it was possible to design something but the technology which was still really based on the 1700s technology base 10 digital, um, it was digital now not analog uh, really couldn't be made until around uh, 2000 when they created Well, it could have been made before that, but it was in the year 2000 they actually made one. Uh, so it was, it's interesting there, it was late me mechanical computing, but it was towards the end of what would be a mechanical computation age, and it was really pushing the, uh, the technology too far, an engineer too far perhaps. Uh, this one I like, um, Amsler's uh, planimeter. I mean, this is a wonderful machine if you've ever played with one. It's a great, great fun because you can't believe that this thing will actually calculate the area of a shape. You start off with a square and you, and you, you, you do a circle and, and it comes up with the right answers and then you start drawing funny shapes, you know. You actually, of course, this is actually still a technique which is used to calculate arbitrary shapes. Um, if you're a, an architect, then you'll be using one of these things at the top. Uh, it's sometimes possible, of course, to, uh, to, do, to do a discrete um, integration on this, but that is only if the, uh, if the shape has got a mathematical description. So it's not, it, this is still a very useful technology. Now, it's in, it is essentially a mechanical technology, but it's how, how clever can you be? to deliver a, uh, a machine for calculating some things. So you can think of this as, it's a, um, a, pro it's a computer with a fixed program. Um, now, a computer with a fixed program is, is kind of familiar, because we use those all over the place. Uh, University of Manchester baby, now we're moving into the first electronic era. We've now moved to base two, but we're, we're definitely in valves. 1947, that's only two years before I was born. To me, that doesn't seem that long ago. To you, it probably seems like past tense to a lot of you. Anyway, there are some grey hairs in the room, I'm pleased to see. Um, now, the, this one, of course, was um, the, the predecessor 
of what we know of as computers. And I suppose we can believe this is a computer because it's in several racks. And somehow that set, soul, that set itself in our psyche. A computer is something which is in racks. And this one is in racks. It's not very clever. Um, and what, it, what it's actually capable of doing is way, way, way below even the computation power inside the, uh, the simplest uh, uh, phone, not even the smartphone. But what about these? I mean, this is the cyber-physical system, as the, uh, the Europeans and uh, the Americans like to call these things. I call them electronic systems. They have a lot more meaning that way. There is a classic computer in there digital electronic software memory. It's got the architecture of a computer, but it's also got all of this stuff. Optics, analog, sensors, mechanics, motors, displays, discharge tube, robot assembly is part of it. Interesting to think about that now, because we're talking now about some technology which is outside the product, which is still part of the product. So if it wasn't possible to do the detailed robot assembly then you wouldn't be able to produce this product. So it's something which is, which is a part of the product, but which is external to the, project, to the product. Plastic, metal. We've got a, a classic computing process here, but we're using, a digit, we're using an image in, and the result is a data file, which is just something which is uh, exchangeable with the environment in which you're going to use it. But it's, it's a processing activity which starts with light, and it ends up with data on a, little, on a little chip card. The main thing about this is that this is a system, and it's many technologies working seamlessly together, in this case to enhance human memory. Now, I like this model because the things that people are prepared to pay for are things which benefit them, and we're still monkeys. We are still very driven by, if, if you look at, um, uh, I can't remember the guy's name now, but there's a uh, Maslow's Pyramid of Needs. There are things that humans need, and in an order of, uh, of their availability. So we want to communicate with people. We want to remember things. We want to go, to, to go and talk to them and, uh, and interact with them. These are all human things. A camera is a, is a vehicle to enhance your memory. Now, I've gone into that in a, in, a, in a broad sense, but I think it's important to remember the industrial context of this as well. Because computers are about business. Because the reason that, that most of these computers are happening is because somebody is going to make some money out of it. But businesses have to be competitive money-making machines. They have to sell things that customers want to buy. Now, I, I can sell a fan, an electronic fan, or I can sell a transistor, a discrete transistor, or I can write an app for a smartphone. They're all components, essentially, without the platform that they're destined towards. They're not going to go to an end customer. The end customer is not going to put money down, back down that flow. And you won't really have a product because you won't have a, a substantial group of people who want to continue to buy it. So most people's involvement in electronic systems is in the life cycle of their electronic systems. They're making components or they're bringing technology or they're bringing knowledge into this. But the success of selling the end product is the thing that funds it all. So they have to sell things that customers want to buy. Now, you've all got two hats. I've got two faces, but the rest of you got two hats. You have your day jobs and you have your life. Life is what you do when you go home. And I know a lot of you don't go home, um, we, but some of us do. And when we do, we have this thing called a normal life. There are other people who live this normal life, and they're not scientists or engineers or anything else like that. They're just driven by their, uh, their individual motives, a lot of which are purely those human motives that I was talking about before. Um, so we've got to appeal to those... Uh, the products have got to appeal to the, uh, to the humans operating in their normal life because these are the people who are going to put their hands into their pockets and buy them and they are going to uh, support the whole chain of their creation. So supporting the end customer's needs who may be several layers above your business. Um, increasingly global competition means that wherever you are, whatever you're supplying, 
do you have a competitor out there somewhere who could be supplying it uh, as well? And they, they're on a more or less equal footing to you. So a guy in a shed in India it can be just as good at mathematics as you are here in, uh, in Newcastle or some other fella down in Silicon Roundabout in London. And what matters from the point of view of somebody who wants to buy that technology is effectively who is the best and who is the cheapest. Uh, now, the, the cheapest is a complicated issue because the cheapest includes the interface costs. So if they speak English and you speak English, then that's one less problem. Uh, if you are working in the same environment, so the same tax environment, then that's another less problem. Um, on the other hand, if they are better, if the product is technically better, then it might, it might offset that cost. And it may be worth paying more to get this better product. Now, those are the decisions that your immediate customer is making on your value prospect. But it tends to mean that businesses increasingly focus on their core competencies in a global market less and less on the things that they're not good at because those things are really supplementary to their primary business. So you do start to get genuinely small companies who have well, no, not no aspirations, have no need to grow bigger than they are because the thing that they are is supported by the size of the company that they are. This changes a lot of business models actually. <clears throat> um, Commoditization is a thing, therefore, that these people struggle to avoid. They want to differentiate themselves from their competitors, and they use cost and quality are the two obvious ways of doing this. Make it cheaper is always a way of making it more attractive. On the other hand, we know that sooner or later, if you make it cheaper, that quality um, is, is compromised. Uh, and so far better is to make an improved business model. So uh, I'm going to give you this thing, but I want to have money back from you as you use it. So that's the business model which is used with these. They pretty well give away a lot of sophisticated technology, uh, but they expect to get revenue from your use of that technology. Um, a new improved technology can be a way of getting that. Now this is, this is a thing that people uh, tend to get a little bit hooked up on actually, is that new technology must be good. New technology may be good, is the answer. You can, imp you can put new technology in, but unless it offers something of value to the end customer, then it doesn't really offer you any advantage because people aren't going to choose to take your product as opposed to somebody else's. And of course, when you use something new, you are increasing the risk because it, uh, you, you as a business are in competition. You may have one chance to miss a tick, but you certainly don't get two. You're out of business, and it's as hard as that. So you have to be competitive, you have to make very sure that if you're going to introduce something new, it gives you an advantage which is greater than the cost and the risk associated with doing it. So product development is a cost to be minimized. Hmm. So it's not exciting in business is the first thing about that. We don't do product development because it's fun. And we don't introduce new technology because it's fun. We introduce it because it's necessary. Um, new technology may cost more than it delivers in product value. Over design, we can't afford that either. So including features which aren't necessary is bad news because there are reasons why it can go wrong. There are reasons why unreliabilities creep in. So this um, it ain't just good, it's good enough. Is, uh, is said jokingly, but it is just about right. What we are aiming for is to produce a good enough product. And I've already said that, but it's because the successful end products are the ones that, that fund the entire value chains, and that includes you, you guys, because you are in feed into this value cycle. Uh, in the universities, doing research programs, you're, you're uh, identifying new sciences and making the steps towards making them technology. Uh, you're, you're exporting them through the students that you educate and the, uh, and the background that they take with them. This is all valuable stuff, and recognizing that you're part of that life cycle is an important thing to realize because you're not in isolation in any of this. Now business opportunities there we now can see are driven entirely by uh, sorry, uh, business is driven entirely by business opportunities and the technologies that emerge are the ones that support the business opportunities. Now back here back in the early 70, in the 70s to 80s 
the computer domain was dominated by mainframes. Uh, and the technologies that were, uh, that were applicable for de delivering mainframes were the ones that were the headline technologies. Now we've moved through a range of uh, application domains over the years and we're now looking at the Internet of Things. These are not specifically narrow markets. What they are is they're just saying about the volumes. We're talking about 100 billion units per year of Internet of Things class deliverables. Now, ARM shipped 10 billion ARM CPUs last year through our partners. These are numbers which are very real. Uh, 10 billion CPUs says a lot about the technology. The things that CPUs are, the ways that you produce the chips, the ways that you pr produce the systems, are going to be dominated by the technologies which are applicable in those domains. Once upon a time it was valves, then it went to transistors, mainframes becoming... Uh, workstations. Uh, now it's dominated by the technologies which are at the top end and it's worth remembering that. So to bring us around to dependability for a moment, um, to be trusted or provide or to do or to provide what's needed, I like that. Um, of course you can find a definition on the web for anything at all so you choose the one that you like and put that on your slides and that's what I did here. Um, so how often can an anti-lock braking system be unavailable? Your mobile phone crash and restart and op autopilot be unavailable? I mean, the, it may s seem a little bit obvious, but they're not all as, they don't all need to be as reliable as they sound. Because as long as they're there when you need them, that's actually all that you require. Um, so if, if an autopilot isn't turned on, the fact that it's not working at that moment doesn't really matter, as long as it's working when you do turn it on. Uh, and the anti-lock braking system, you know, how, long, how often does that system sit in your car and is never used? Um, the, so you, you really wouldn't mind too much if it crashed and restarted a few times, as long as it was working when you actually hit the brake pedal. Uh, this is a, uh, if you don't recognize this, is, this of course is an apple with a Windows blue screen of death on it, which is just an indication of uh, a mixture of technologies. <coughs> Uh, how often can a power grid crash, however? That's a lot more difficult. Uh, how often can an engine management unit get stuck, stuck at full throttle? Um, a spurious cash transaction occur in your bank account? All of those things are never. Um, then there's a, a bunch of things which are perhaps a little bit more difficult to say. How often can a PC crash before it's unusable? I mean, we've all lived through the Windows era of PCs when they did crash, on, uh, but we didn't stop using them. Um, how often can a weather forecast be incorrect before it matters? You know, it's, um, does it matter to me too much that the weather forecast is sunny outside and it's raining? Uh, no, it doesn't actually, but it might matter if it was where I was going to choose a route for an aircraft. Uh, so, surprisingly often uh, is the answer there. Uh, but the other thing is, humans are inclined to believe, to blame themselves. So how often when you've, you've been in the middle of a phone call, it drops out and you think, oh, I must have pushed a button with my ear or whatever, I've done something wrong. The first inclination is to, bl to blame yourself. So an awful lot of the, the defects that we're seeing in systems around us are, um, are, are, are real defects in the system, but we just get over it. Uh, so dependability is subjective and it's application and it's user, user and it's context dependent. I mean, it's, it really just come under that great umbrella of quality because quality is a subjective term and I like that. You can't, you can design with quality in mind, but in many respects you can only measure quality in retrospect. You can only look back and say, that was a good product, that was a bad one, uh, that was a good choice, that was a bad choice. So, I think we've got to the idea that end products are about function, not about technology. And these are just a few examples I used a little while ago because they were, they were challenges, if you like. Try and work out, is that a hardware or a software module? Or is this describing a hardware or a software system? I mean, you can look at the innards of a, of a hard disk and say, well, what we're actually talking here is a data store. It's, di it's digital data in, digital data out. But, and if you close the lid on that as a black box, you wouldn't have a clue how it was working. And yet it's a highly mechanical system. Uh, and that's uh, uh, not to be un unappreciated. That is a black box, which is electronics in, electronics out, and yet far from electronics in the content. 
So that last point was where does the where do the errors occur then? Where are the vulnerabilities? <coughs> So I'll look at some of the, uh, the vulnerabilities then. Of course, we all assume um, for a long history that electronics is dependable or the physical electronic hardware is dependable. Uh, in point of fact, um, Boolean mathematics is dependable, but the implementation depends on a reliable mapping between equations and the physical world. Now, a gate, a logic gate, um, is not actually binary, it's analog. Um, and that means that uh, the transistors don't switch on and off neatly, they sort of switch on and off. And the output voltage is not 1 or naught. it's 5 volts or whatever the supply rail is, or something approaching the, uh, that. And it's got noise on it and all sorts of things like that. Now, in the main, this hasn't mattered too much. And the approximation between an AND gate and a physical implementation has held good for probably around 30 years. The problem is that we're pushing the bounds of technology now. Um, today's 20 nanometer transistors, and to, if 20 nanometers of scale, you could put 3,000 of them side by side in the thickness of a banknote. So it's pretty damn small. Um, a, uh, uh, an average picture that you, that you take on your smartphone takes an area, a physical area on a memory chip, equivalent to a thickness of a banknote in two dimensions. So it's an ever so, ever so little micro dot, if you want to think of it that way. These are very, very small. They have increasingly got large variabilities. And of course, today, as the processes get smaller, you can put more and more of them on a chip. So the die still looks about the same as it did before. It's a small gray object. Uh, but uh, it has a large number of transistors, typically 500 million uh, in 2012, or, you know, around a billion is not uncommon at all today. And each one of those transistors essentially has to work. If we're going to believe the Boolean model of mathematics that we're, that we're creating the circuits on, then each one of those 500 million to a billion to 2 billion, whatever the current number is of the transistors has to work because otherwise the basic connection of Boolean mathematics to logic gates is broken. So at 70 degrees C, the variation in VT, and the, that's the threshold voltage of a transistor. Um, it's the notional point at which the transistor turns on and off. It's actually a very soft point in reality. It's when it's more on than off. Um, the, v, the VT varies and it generally, if you go through the numbers, it generally comes out that today we would expect around 100 transistors per chip that don't switch off. Now, that would break the chip, wouldn't it, surely? Um, and there are another 100 or so on there which are only weakly on. So they're, uh, they're not really able to drive as fast or as much power as is expected. And what's, what's more, because these are actually... Um, down to uh, uh, basic probabilities associated with atoms, then you can't predict where they are. They're everywhere. And they're different from one chip to the next. Uh, so you can't make um, specific preparation for weaknesses that have been found on there because these are, uh, are, are just the intrinsic variability that occurs. So today's chips shouldn't work, should they? But getting around that, mitigating it to some degree, we do know that not all transistors are at 70 degrees C. And actually, some of them are hotter, but some of them are quite surprisingly colder. You know, a transistor is a pretty small thing. Uh, silicon is not that good a conductor. Uh, and you do actually have uh, residual heat. So if the transistor has been on, uh, been dissipating, um, it's, it's going to be hotter than the local environment. But at the same time, if it's, if it's not been on and it's out towards the edge of the chip, it quite, can be quite considerably colder. Not all transistors are minimum size. Increasing the area of the transistor reduces the variability. Not all of the transistors are on the critical path. So the fact that the transistor is slow, or maybe a gate is a bit more leaky than it should be, doesn't necessarily stop the circuit working. Uh, and not all functionality is easily observable. Now that's, that's a, a, an interesting one, because not all non-functionality is easily observable. So some transistors in there may be dead, but actually it's very difficult for you to see their operation in the, at the high level of the circuit. So if you have protection circuits in there, um, let's say error detection circuits, 
how do you test an error detection circuit if you don't have errors? So you, your, your circuit may be non-functioning, but when you do the rest of the test around the system, then the, the, the error detection system is not, not working properly. You don't, you don't notice it. The other thing that's apparent is that CMOS logic, those, the four transistor construction that I showed, turns out to be incredibly robust. It will still behave as a logical function with very leaky transistors, and indeed with some transistors which, which aren't even there. And you do get some rather strange operation, though. You get a gate which will behave like a two-input NAND gate the first time. But then the second time, it remembers what it was the first time, and it now produces a random result. So as long as you're only using the gate the one time, and a lot of applications, you know, with a lot of settling time in the meantime, a lot of, a lot of the applications can be like that. And then the chances of getting a second extreme transistor along one critical path is a very large number, you know, the probability of getting one on an a specific path is actually very low, uh, but then the chances of getting a second one on the same path is actually Im very, very improbable. And so you can say some things here that, uh, you know, if, if you're going to have one transistor in there and it's defective, then the chances of there being other ones which are other than average is actually quite low. So you, we're multiplying huge numbers by very small probabilities, and we're doing it several times. So the, the, the fact is that we have no idea what the quality of our hardware is going to be like. Now, memory, guys, quite, um, I guess, out of necessity, realized that they couldn't yield all of the transistors that a memory needed. You know, if you, if you have a uh, 16K, 64K, uh, 32K, 64K, 128K, getting bigger memories, and this has been the case when ARM started, uh, the idea of putting a uh, 32K cache on board, was, we had to stop, we couldn't put it on there, because we couldn't yield 32K of memory. And it was a, it was a big piece of die at that time. Uh, nowadays, we have 128, 256K caches on board, on chip. Um, and the reason that we're able to do that, obviously the processes have got smaller, but we also are including correction capabilities. Spare rows and columns are included in the, in the RAMs, so that dynamically you're able to exchange parts of the memory which have stopped working with other parts which are there in reserve. They're just sitting there waiting. It doesn't matter, it's worth putting them in. You have to have some control in there to decide how you're going to do it. Uh, historically, this was done with lasers, uh, but nowadays, increasingly, you can put a processor in there. The processor's job is to test the memory and to reconfigure the memory to, to make sure that it still stays working. And, surprisingly, as much as 75% of the area of a typical die is memory today. The logic which just pours in between it is relatively small stuff. So the sensitive area has a repair strategy, and the rest is in inherently more robust. So we've got mitigating circumstances here, but none of them fix the problem. They only make it better. So we haven't included lots of other fa factors on this. Um, externally and internally generated synchronous noise. We can't begin to simulate that environment. High energy particles, we know they exist, and the smaller the geometries are more susceptible to them. Uh, wear out. Transistors traditionally don't wear out. Well, they do when they get as small as this. The metal migrates, the transistor VT and gain both, both move. Um, it depends on how they are used. So a transistor which is hardly used doesn't vary as much as one which is used a lot. Um, temperatures greater than 70 degrees C, I mentioned that. Um, we increasingly, to, to squeeze performance out of, uh, out of circuits, are getting closer and closer to the limits, which means that we design for 140 degrees C operation, which is theoretically the limit. We can't go any higher than that. The problem is we design for 140, we're actually designing for a typical 140. The actual extreme temperatures are probably higher than that. Uh, this now starts to degrade insulation materials and other things like that on chips. So it's, you know, we're moving, we're, we're trying hard, and there's a consequence of trying hard is that we're actually making things more vulnerable. Not an unsubstantial task in this is the, limited ability, the limitations of verification and test. Um, the state space of the machines that we're creating is huge, and the 
uh, the possibility, even the logic space of, uh, of testing all of the options, for example, in the 32 by 32 bit multiplier, is zero. We haven't got enough time to verify 32 by 32, by 32 and we certainly haven't got enough time to test it on a die by die basis. So, essentially, when we're doing testing on any of these things, we're only taking a very limited subset. We essentially look for functionality and we do a fairly coarse test of the major things that it's not supposed to do and then there's a big gap. So it's not surprising in some respects that we can't pick up all of the problems. Um, as I said, we're multiplying tiny improbables by very large numbers and we really have no idea about the reliability, dependability of modern systems or components. Um, we know that things will get worse as processes get smaller and what matters, of course, is we're building systems here and systems are getting more complex and I'm talking about commercial systems we'll look at what's inside a couple of these commercial systems in a moment but a commercial system ain't what it used to be it's not a chip anymore it's tens of chips so we're not talking about failures in a chip we're talking about failures in tens of chips and the software which is sat on top of them because it's the functionality of the system that matters Transistors will get, continue to get smaller and designers will erode the safety margins to get more performance and they will erode them as far as they can. They're being pushed, they have to get performance, nobody has told them yet that they've encountered a limit so therefore there is no limit, they move forward, they have to. And I think this is the really irritating part. Despite the fact that the, all of these things are against us, we do actually yield electronic system products today. You know, you can actually go down and buy these things and they do make money out of them. They are, it is possible to make these complex systems. So, we are using unknown safety factors is all I can say. We've built a bridge here. The bridge is looking very exotic and very fine. Uh, and we know that we're getting closer to the limits, but we really don't know where the limits are. I hope to have retired by the time we discover where the limits are, incidentally. <coughs> How about software then? Software surely must be uh, uh, more reliable because it is, after all, a mathematical process. Um, it's strange, therefore, that all software crashes. I suppose you can conclude that all software crashes because it's on hardware platforms and they are unreliable. But I think the truth is also uh, there's, there's some guys out there who've been monitoring quality of software for many years and uh, the problem with a fundamentally uh, a methodology which, st which starts by creating something which is broken and then tests it right is in itself not a good way to, pr to create quality uh, because you can only find the bugs that you test, you don't find the bugs that you don't test. Um, now software reuse offers improved quality which is great you know your TCP IP stack is going to get better as you find more bugs in it but of course it's still not arbitrarily right all that happens is you found more bugs in it and if you're able to reuse it then you're using software in which more bugs have been found but you still haven't got a clue how many bugs are left in there and what's more you can still be using it in a way that nobody else has used it and we find this irritatingly we have great big circuit blocks which have been used for the first, well, they've been used for the nth time, but somebody has used them in a different way, and it's got a bug in it. And all of the other versions have theoretically got this bug in it, but it's never mattered to the other versions. And so you have to watch out for that. But these numbers, I think, are quite startling. Well-structured and tested source code has the order of five errors per thousand lines of, co of code. That's a huge number of errors. Five errors per thousand lines of code. Surely we can write better, better code than that. Well, the answer is that commercial code is typically five times worse than that. That's good code, is the five, five per thousand. Um, the only thing that we know is most of them are harmless. That's, that's really helpful when you're developing a, de a dependable system, isn't it? You know that, um, that uh, there is going to be some in there which are really serious, but actually most of them are harmless. We'll not worry about the ones that are certain. So, now, formal methods are better. I'm not going to say they're perfect because we still have, uh, I, I still hear of formal systems crashing, so I don't know what that tells us again in the same way. But they still have to work on an imperfect platform. I think the other, the other message there is don't underestimate the commercial importance of time to market and cost. Um, commercial imperatives are making an, impre uh, making an entry into this domain. Commercial imperatives say we have got to produce a system. 
They don't say, we'll wait to produce this system until you've got the methodology sorted out. They will go ahead and they will do it. They will uh, test whether it's good enough by putting it in the field. And if people complain or die too, too frequently, then they will do something about it. But essentially, it's a proof by, um, by deduction. Uh, it will, we will see it works if it works. Now the other thing that I've, I've started to get a bit irritated about over the years is that really when people talk about hardware and software, they talk about them as like different islands, that they're somehow isolated one from another. This is the reality of hardware design today. Verilog language is a language. This is the, the reality of software design today. C, it's a language. They both have compilers. The compilers are different, but not fundamentally different. They just target different platforms. Their machines, or the, the languages are ex, uh, ways of expressing state and logic. Um, the hardware languages are better at expressing concurrency. The software languages are better at handling state. Uh, they're just different languages. There are different languages, and different languages have different advantages. So this, we must stop talking about hardware and software. What we're talking about is creating systems, and there are ways which are optimized in terms of the architecture of those systems. So I make choices about which things I'm going to implement in hardware and which things I'm going to implement in software. That's an architectural decision on the system. It's not my decision as a, as a programmer, let's say, in either of the languages that we're talking about. And of course, we're all familiar with Heartbleed Bug of recent, uh, recent months. Uh, the great open source delusion, as I call it. Um, that because it's possible for people to see the bugs, that they will see the bugs. And the answer is, of course they won't. Uh, because they're, they, they're deluded, because people could look at this thing, that people are looking at this thing. And of course, the, uh, the actual error uh, that occurred was an emission in a non-functional aspect of the code. So it was a systems-related aspect, not in the primary function of the code. So people who are looking at the code and looking for its primary functionality wouldn't see this error. It's an error of how, it, how the code could be misused that actually uh, leaked through. Now, it was, was it the fault of the software source, the Open SSL Foundation, for releasing something which wasn't really product worthy? Or was it the community who was too ready to believe in the quality of open source software? I think the answer is you can't actually allocate blame to anybody. If we're building complex systems and we're driven by the commercial imperative, which we inevitably are, we have to make decisions and we have to proceed. So it's about, and this is what, what I, a, 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 a thing which has been buzzing in my mind for a while actually, it's about designing a computer system. It's about creating a model of behavior to meet non-functional constraints. It's about, the process of design is about creating a model of behavior to meet non-functional constraints. This thing behaves as you expect it to do. You've got a model in your mind about what you expect that to do. And when it does it, it's, it's just f conforming to that model that you have in your mind. So you create, initially the process of design is to create a model of what you want to do on a generic platform. And it might be that that model is in your head. The best computer that we still have is the one between our ears. It's the best one in our mind. This computer is fantastic because it will work with sparse information and it will draw hard conclusions. But you can't get that from the best EDA tool. The best EDA tool says, as soon as you can express it in a mathematical way, then I can exercise it for you. Brain isn't, doesn't have that limitation. You can model the whole system in your brain. It may not be 100% correct, but it tells you whether you've got the right idea or not. And you convert that model. You translate it to a functional model on an optimal platform. And I think the, the thing that's still surprised here is it's still a functional model. It's just the platform that's changed. You've ported this to another platform from a concept where the platform really didn't matter to a concept where the platform matters. You've just optimized the, function, the, the, the um, functional model to match that platform to achieve non-functional constraints. So it's got to operate real time, it's got to do within a power budget, it's got to fit inside a smartphone, whatever the, the criteria is, but it's still a model. So the, the exercise here, we, we still have a model, a computer model running on a platform which has been somehow optimized. 
So it's evolving the model and the platform. Model and the platform. You know, we're not used to that degree of flexibility, and yet that's what we're doing. Uh, until functional and non-functional performance is adequate. Adequate, not even perfect. Just adequate. <clears throat> so, a, compute, a 2014 computer platform today, whoa, I'm really running out of time, uh, is something like this. Um, and to put some scale on it, that Exynos processor in there has got eight uh, ARM CPUs in it and nine Mali GPUs in it. So that's eight to eight, 16, 15 CPUs, or 15 processing units in that single chip. This other chip over here, which is a memory chip, has got another processor in it, and I'll come into the technology in that one in a moment. But there's a lot of processors, probably around 30 in this modern processor. There's about 12 in this one, so it gives you an idea of how fast it's progressing. Um, inside the ARM, inside the A4 process, processor which is here, we have something like this. It's a smart, smart technology, but it's basically a processor die with two memory die above it. Now this is another technology, it's not electronics, it's actually assembly, it's the, the manufacturing technique which allows us to do things like this because it allows us to put three chips in the space of one, which allows us to make this portable computing device that much smaller. The Samsung memory chip is a startling thing which will allow you to put up to 128 gigabytes of, uh, of memory into a package which is 1.4 millimeters thick by stacking uh, six, is eight, 16 die, one on top of another inside that space. Yield of something like that is very poor, but if you put a smart interface on it, so you give it a, a, a computer as well, then it doesn't need to worry about the areas on it which are not working because it just works around them. The processor itself, this one here, is the Tegra, uh, NVIDIA's Tegra back in 2012. It's, it shows as having four main processor cores, five, it's actually got seven, there's two other ones in there as well, all ARM processors, about a billion transistors. Um, just to give the idea of scale on this thing, there's three transistors and the amount of interconnect necessary to connect up those three. There's a billion on that chip, gives you an idea. It's not just the transistors which are complicated. The complication comes in how you connect them together. Now, Apple don't usually say very much about their products, but uh, back in uh, 2011, they were forced by uh, the American government to uh, disclose their number of suppliers. And so they, they listed these tier one suppliers, 159 of them. These are teams which are contributing specialist knowledge and know-how into ARM's products. And this list, incidentally, doesn't include ARM, because ARM is a tier two supplier. And there is at least 10 times that number of tier two suppliers. And it's only there where we start to crop up. Uh, but these are, of course, the, w these products are so sophisticated that the only way they can be viably put together is to bring together all of this specialist knowledge and know-how all around the world. It's not something which is designed in California and manufactured in China, like it says on the back. That's just the final stage. It's not something that was designed by Jonathan Ive either. He just happens to be the one who is most visible. These, this means this whole ecosystem is supporting the development of these products and the products are more than 90 percent reused from one generation to the next. So Moore's, Moore's <coughs> law you're familiar with, you're perhaps less um, uh, observant of the fact that uh, it means that since ARM was formed just 20 years ago there are 20,000 times more capacity on an integrated circuit than there was back then, 20,000 times. Um, so we, we're still producing something that looks like a small grey object, it's just that it has 20,000 times more hardware in it. And of course the systems are actually probably 20,000 squared more complex, because the early systems had practically no software on, nothing on the chip itself. The modern systems do, they have many, many processes, much software, a lot, of it, a lot of software on the chip itself. Now back then, and the reason why I'm using an ITRS 1999 diagram is they stopped creating it after this point, but back then they were highlighting essentially a very under, underplayed part, and that was this productivity gap. 
because although the capacity was going up on the top line, Moore's Law, the lower line was the productivity, how fast the EDA tools productivity was going up. And you can see the gap was manageable back in 1991. It was about 100 person years. But by now, it will be thousands of person years. And that's excluded the verification gap, which was also starting to make an appearance. The thing that cured this was reuse. Today's systems re use reuse in the hardware, in the software, in the electronics, in the, in the mechanics, in the RF parts, and all throughout these systems. What's gone before, not just what's gone before in that company, but what's gone before in other companies, feed into this product in a way which is previously unthought about. And it's still not really noticed and nobody really appreciates it. Reuse has become a technology uh, driver. Designer productivity has become the, the driver. The product possibilities offered by billions of affordable transistors is entrancing. Marketing people love it because they know that if they can make a really, really sexy product, they can sell it because there's consumers out there who will buy it. And uh, you, know, you and me in our ordinary lives will actually take these things. The only problem is how are we going to do it? How are we going to deliver them? And reuse, hardware, software, other technologies, methods and tools, in company and out company, um, all improved quality by re reusing, but of course the quality only tends towards zero defects, is not zero defects. Reuse methodology on the other hand does seem to be good enough for commercial applications. It's fair enough to conclude that rigorously, that rigorous, and that should say clean sheet approaches will be orders of magnitude higher costs because if you don't use this reuse environment then you're having to design the whole thing yourselves. All of a sudden those thousands of man years that, uh, that they were predicting back in 1990, 1991 become a reality. You've got to find the thousands of man years to design your product and that's a big cost. So, you, so essentially the use of commercial techniques for dependable systems is inevitable. The available components and subsystems are unreliable. So the components which are available to you are unreliable. Get over it. Now that's said in a, in a, a literal way and a figurative way. So it's uh, get over it. You know, that's the way it is, guys. But the other thing is find a way to do it because that's what it's about. It's don't depend on systems working because they ain't going to work. So briefly scudding through uh, what ARM brings to this, we bring complexity. Um, we bring a range of cores, uh, ranging from tiny ones with 50,000 transistors to, in, to large ones in 50 million transistors. Um, they are applicable for different domains, but it means that we have 24 processor cores in our family. We tend to be associated with having a processor core. Um, but of course you don't just provide the processes, we have to help people to use them. And so we enable them to make really wildly complex systems like these look one, two, three, four quad core processors. So that's up to six, uh, four, four, sixteen processors there. And we've not included the DSP processors over here. So we're giving people the ability to create systems with 30 odd heterogeneous processors in them in essentially products of this nature. Now that capability is going to be interested to people who are designing autonomous systems. And those people who are designing autonomous systems are going to be designing them for dependable applications. So, you know, get real. This is the other stuff. This is the stuff below the tip of the iceberg. We may be known to be providing those CPU cores, but we also have to provide software, drivers, OSs, ports, tools, utilities, physical components to, the CPU, to, to implement the CPUs and GPUs, the interconnect systems, the cell libraries, the partnerships working with people who are working in the EDA environment, in the fabrication environment. We have 900 licensees, millions of developers working around our technology to deliver the products that they want to deliver instantly. So very quickly, we can't design it right, we can't make it right, we can't keep it right. And it all gets worse as the shrinks and complexity grow. Yet we do make systems that work. What is the explanation? Why are we able to make systems that work? That's a very good question and I would love to know the answer to it. Because if we don't have an answer to it, then we're just harbingers of ever-threatening doom. You know, oh my god, the world's going to end tomorrow. Commercially, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll just get on with it, okay? 
And the more times they're proven right, the less credible you become. So facing the unavoidable truth, system level dependency is what matters, um, reuse is an inevitable, uh, well, I'll, read it, I'll read it out, dependable systems need reuse components and subsystems, physical and virtual for productivity. We're not excluding software, we're not, not saying it's going to be hardware. All components that are reused are part of this problem and they're part of the productivity opportunity. The only ones which are, which are affordable are the commercial ones. Clean sheet design is off the table. It's almost forget it time. I mean, there may be some applications out there where, where cost is no object, but in terms of numbers, they're diminishing fast. Even military applications these days demand the use of commercial technology because they can't afford to, to develop specifically mili military operations uh, products anymore. And the only place to implement system level de dependability then is at the system layer. That's a logical conclusion from this. If everything else down there is defective, the only place where you can create dependability is at the top layer. Because it's the only at the top layer where you know what correct operation is and you know what you, what you should do when you don't see it. Um, and the, the, you've got to accept the fact that stuff down there will mostly work, but not all the time. 99.99, 99.999, however many nines you want percent of the time it will work okay, but some of the time it's not going to. And when it doesn't, that's when the top layer has to come in and intervene. And I think that this is the only viable strategy for creating dependable systems. So we need a toolbox to help us to get over it. That's a reality. Um, the only universal interpretation of fail-safe is fail-functional. But the good news is, mostly, it's only one or two things which are so vital. The rest of the stuff can be sacrificed. You know, um, aeronautics, electronics is not terribly uh, reliant on the, uh, the, the, the in-seat entertainment unit sitting in front of you working all the time. You know, the plane can still fly without the entertainment unit working. And so, you know, not everything in a plane has to be high reliability. And so we have to think about it, though. I mean, clearly one approach is to design everything to be reliable, but that's unaffordable. So we increasingly have to focus on the things that actually need to be reliable. And what do you mean by reliability? Um, this approach can be applicable even in the zero case. So not everything matters even when it does go wrong. It means that you, you can actually put no protection in the, in the top level if that's actually what's required. So we, we, we can have actually start to think in terms of producing a method for dependability, which includes not dependable at all. It's not... Uh, it, it's, it's just a linear extrapolation of the degree of, of protection and how much effort you put into it. Uh, but the, the methodology does need to change, or does need to recognize this. Um, from an industrial point of view, we need a toolbox. I mean, there are some tools that we know about. Memory repair, memory systems, overcoming memory limitations by handling files, not addresses. Um, we know about uh, double and triple redundancy. Um, mostly we can't afford that, um, but it's, you know, we know it's there. Uh, generally speaking, when we start to run into limitations of systems, then we will probably start to go to double. And in fact, we've got some products which are designed with double redundancy at the moment. Um, and the approach there is if they disagree, you, you raise your hands and you go, ah, I don't know what's gone wrong, and you hand control back over to the driver. And that's a... This is a, an approach which is used in, uh, in anti-lock braking systems and stuff of that nature. Uh, I hear of defensive programming, a te technique for building checking into software. And these are, I think, the, the difference in the, uh, in the issue from the point of view of a, a consumer needing, A, to identify that there really is a problem, and B, if there is a problem, what am I going to do about it? Because I learned very early on, if I go, uh, go into the board, the board meeting, and say to the board, I've identified a problem, they go, oh my God, and what should we do about it? And, that, and the thing is, it's no good me just identifying a problem and saying, well, I thought actually you'd like to know there's a problem. Because I've actually got to go along with a solution as well. Uh, because the, the default from their point of view is, if there is no solution, then it's business as usual. Because they can't decide to stop. They have to continue. So conclusions then. Oh dear. <clears throat> Systems are what customers buy. They expect, to, expect them to be dependable enough. Um, 
talked about that. Commercial components, we've talked about that. They have to be commercial components. The only ones affordable. They work better than we would rightly expect, uh, but we really can't quantify their quality. Uh, we, we don't know enough about it, is still the issue. And dependable systems must be based on less dependable components. And the, the, probably the, the major message is the commercial imperative won't wait for the right way before it produces systems that people depend on. So, thank you very much for listening.